Okay. So I want to welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Katie and I'm a librarian here at the Lyon Township Public Library. I want to thank you all for joining us and especially thank you to author Tom Carr for taking the time to spend this evening with us. And before I turn it over to him, I just want to go over a few housekeeping details. Please be patient and bear with us if there are any technology teams, and this would include freezing, any sound or video issues, or if we get disconnected, and hopefully that doesn't happen, but if it does, just use the same link as before to rejoin the meeting. Some things are just simply the result of internet speed, toggling, or connection issues, and possibly may not be within our control. And we are recording this Zoom event. We'll be spotlighting our presenter who will be sharing his screen. Please feel welcome to keep your video off or turn it on. I know Tom already mentioned that he likes to have someone to look at. And there is a closed captioning button. I have turned it on, but if you do not want that on, you, you do have the ability to turn it off. You can also move it out of the way or place it wherever you would like in the Zoom window if, um, if you would like to. And it's not always perfect, but it gets the job done. Also, I'll be monitoring the chat and I'll keep everyone muted. Uh, please use the chat option to ask questions as they come up. Uh, Tom would like to wait until the end of his presentation to answer any questions that you may have, but feel free to just put them in there and I'll make sure they're answered in the order that they were uh, asked. Also, um, I'm mentioning all of this just to ensure a smooth flow without any type of disruptions. Uh, you may also notice that I may mute you if for some reason your audio turns on, or I may turn your video off if your video is too distracting. Uh, if you are a caller, I, will, um, I just want you to know that you are able to ask questions as well. And it looks like my auto, audio is a little muffled. Um, I apologize, I don't know, it's my headset. So I'm not sure, maybe you just need to turn the volume up a little bit. Uh, I can turn mine up too. I don't know if that'll make a difference. Um, and then lastly, just to let you know if there's anything inappropriately disruptive during the event, whether through sound or video, it may result in your dismissal. And this is just to ensure that everyone can enjoy this event in a comfortable and safe online environment. And uh, next, I want to invite you to participate in our upcoming virtual events. And you can find those on our website at ltpl.org. Just go to the attend tab and to the event calendar and you'll find all of our upcoming events there. I believe we have um, Fantastical Beasts with Howl Nature Center tomorrow at 6 p.m. and registration is still open for that. And if you're interested in genealogy on Friday at 2 p.m., we have I Can't Read That Tips for Translating Foreign Genealogy Documents. Um, lastly, I will put in a survey into the chat for you to take at your convenience. And um, this is just to get feedback from you to let us know how we're doing and to get some ideas for any future events you'd like to attend. So without further ado, I want to welcome author Tom Carr. And just a second here, let me pull this up. I wanted to give his bio. Tom Carr is an independent writer and journalist in Northern Michigan who spent 25 years in daily, daily newspapers, primarily the Traverse City Record Eagle. He's won journalistic awards for his investigative reporting, feature writing, breaking news and humor columns, and often covered police courts and crime. So take it away, Tom, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Thank you for having me here, and it's great to see you everybody who is uh, here to talk about uh, Michigan's dark history and true crime. Um, I started writing about these things. Actually, as a reporter, I did cover some true crime, as Katie mentioned in the intro there. Um, when um, And uh, five years ago, I published my first book, Blood on the Mitten. I am going to talk about stories from all three of my books tonight. So I'm it's Dark Side of the Mitten is my latest 
And there's a, all three of them have a slightly different angle, but it's about crimes and dastardly deeds in Michigan and dark history. So um, might as well start with like the worst of the worst. And in Michigan, uh, well, perhaps we'll start with the most prolific serial killer in Michigan history. But wait, no, that's not this guy. This guy, actually, I lived, I grew up in Northville. So like the people who were in South Lyon in the 19, uh, late 1960s, and an early 1970s story of John Norman Collins who was murdering young women in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. So he's probably the most infamous of Michigan's serial killers, but the actually most prolific serial killer in the state history is, was a woman by the name of Mary McKnight. She used strychnine to kill her victims and many of them were family members. She killed 12 people, which is more than the uh, seven that John Norman Collins is known to have killed. Some people believe that she may have killed up to 18 people. She killed husbands, cousins, a brother and his family. His brother and his wife are the tombstones that you see up there. They were his last, her last victims. What you don't see listed on there is the the child who uh, was buried in her mother's arms. But it was Strychnine who did it. And um, well, also we should talk just very briefly also about Michigan's, uh, how would you say it, number one mass murderer. And that was a guy by the name of Andrew Kehoe. And what he did was blew up the Bath School, which is not that far from you either. It's probably about 30 to 45 minutes to the northwest of South Lyon, just outside of Lansing. It still stands as the worst school massacre in the history of the United States. 45 victims were killed, including the killer and his wife, uh, who died in different fashions that day. Um, but let's see, the um, Michigan also has a lot of colorful history when it comes to crime. We even have pirates. I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Seavey who operated in Lake Michigan in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Operated a schooner where he Transport a lot of legitimate stuff, but he also transported a lot of illegal things like poached venison, like stolen timber, illegally uh, made alcohol, and also human cargo. He would kidnap some people and uh, sell them into slavery in Chicago where he took some of his other goods. When he was, uh, he, he didn't use a sword. He had no eye patch. He didn't look at all like Jack Sparrow, but he did at one point use a cannon when somebody was horning in on his illegal venison trade. He put a hole in the side of the, that, uh, shall we say competitor's craft, sunk it along with all of the crew. When he, retired, the federal government employed him to help them to find other pirates on the Great Lakes. And that's some of the more colorful things that, you know, just to get us into the, the dark side of Michigan, and I love Michigan, but the dark side of anything is so much more interesting. Uh, and my new book is called Dark Side of the Mitten. And I just want to talk, one of the many things that I cover in there are some of the people that we know and maybe admire or assume are admirable people because so many things are named after them. Of course, we know who Henry Ford is. He's the guy on the right in this picture. The guy on the left is Harry Bennett. Now, Henry Ford was anti-Semitic. He was quite the uh, uh, colorful character and uh, 
he didn't make any bones about his uh, his prejudices in the early 20s. Uh, in fact, he circulated newspapers about it. Harry Bennett was his right-hand man for much of his career, and he showed stag films in the office. He had a gun in his drawer, and he roughed up anybody who tried to unionize Ford Motor Company back in the day. We also, of course, the name Cadillac is so immortal, not only because of he founded Detroit, but the car made it his name known throughout the, the um, world. The logo for Cadillac Motor Company, by the way, is the same as Antoine de la Motte Cadillac's coat of arms, except that he made up that coat of arms. When he escaped, he was in trouble in France, escaped over here, made up a coat of arms to make it seem like he was noble, of noble birth, and he did most of his uh, dealings quite often with the uh, Native Americans. He, of course, gave them brandy for their pelts, got them hooked on it, but he kept the brandy locked up. And when he was the, when he was the leader of Fort Detroit, he kept that brandy under lock and key. And a lot of the people who lived there, the French people would have liked it. So the Native Americans didn't, ended up not liking him and neither did his fellow Frenchmen. Even Chief Pontiac, another car brand, of course, and another city in Michigan named after him. There's a dark chapter. He acted heroically in helping to try to stave off the European invasion uh, against uh, the, the in, in, in the uh, North America. And he banded together many of the tribes. But there's a story about him that he drowned a seven-year-old British girl. Now, in his defense, he, she had dysentery and he had every reason to be afraid of white people's diseases because it had already decimated the Native American population. However, it was rather cold to drown a seven-year-old girl. Now there are disputes on that story, but he actually never disputed it according to historians. Now, if you live in the Detroit area, you hear about William C. Beaumont, the Beaumont Hospitals. Beaumont, this is kind of an amusing story, but it's kind of, you know, it's not, not a crime and it's not, he just kind of took advantage of the poor guy that he's seen sewing up there. Or rather it's not, he's not actually sewing it up. He, that's what it looks like. But up on Mackinac Island, Alexis St. Martin was a French Canadian who was in the fur trade. In a trading post, he was shot by accident in the abdomen, just below the chest. And the way it healed was such that the hole stayed open. But the sides, the inside and the outside healed together. So forever, he had a hole there, went right into his stomach. This was a jackpot for William C. Beaumont, who was a doctor, who was working for the military on the island at the time. And he's tied food on a string and dropped it in poor Alexis St. Martin's stomach and watched. And he was very instrumental. He, I mean, he did achieve a lot. Beaumont, he discovered so much of what we know now about the digestion of food because of poor Alexis St. Martin, who I might add, as far as I know, does not have a hospital named after him. But the thing is, he, now here is uh, Beaumont, an actual photo of him, and a drawing of Alexis St. Martin and the hole that he had in his chest. Beaumont is said to have taken advantage of the fact that he was illiterate and that Alexis St. Martin was illiterate and he had him sign away uh, his rights to be uh, basically his guinea pig for, for about a decade or two. Now, he also had him do a lot of chores for him. He basically had him be an indentured servant even while he was using him to experiment on. 
Well, the ending was, I guess, uh, uh, when, when Alexis St. Martin died, he had, a, he was back in Quebec, his family left his body out in a field under a hot sun, August sun for several days and let the crows pick at it. And their reasoning was they did it on purpose before they buried him because even though William Beaumont was gone, many other doctors were constantly contacting saying, may do experiments on you. And he had had enough. They didn't even want him doing experiments on his dead body by that time. Now, I also go about in my, my book, some of the big issues and how Michigan fits into some of the dark issues in American history. And of course, this is a map of the Underground Railroad, which helped slaves escape into Northern states and ultimately into Canada often. Also, I talk about some of the other names that we've heard, Cass, Cass County, Cass Tech, Cassopolis. Um, Lewis Cass, he was an early governor, an actual territorial, territorial governor and a later candidate for president of the United States. He owned slaves, as did many in Michigan for a time, because before slave, slavery was illegal, as of 1890, or, I'm sorry, 1787, the Northwest Compact, it was legal up to then. And until Michigan became a state, many people still practiced it. Augustus Woodward, driving down Woodward, you think he must have been a pretty uh, interesting, uh, so, you know, to have the, I know that Woodward Avenue has to be named after a guy. So it must be some great guy who did great things. Well, he kind of did. He, he, he laid out the map of Detroit and how the streets go around in a, like a spokes in a wheel. But he also never bathed. Even the, in the early 1800s, he was known to be have terrible hygiene. I mean, back when people by, by necessity just didn't have the hygiene we have today, didn't have the plumbing, et cetera. He also owned a slave. It was an older Native American man uh, who he kept for as long as he stayed in Detroit. There are some heroic stories too. Now this is from Crosswell and he had gotten from Kentucky to Marshall, Michigan via the Underground Railroad, he and his entire family. When somebody in the family that had owned him back in Kentucky found out that they were in Marshall, they sent a posse up to get her, to get them and bring them back. The entire, well, a hundred or so people from the town of Marshall when the posse was there trying to get the family to come, maybe 100, 150 people surrounded the house where they were to try to keep this from happening. They eventually were able to sneak the family out while they were distracting the posse members and they did make it to Canada by covered wagon in the, in the middle of the night. And I also go into the expulsion of much of the Native American population in Michigan. Now, this is a little booklet that was sold at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair by Chief Simon Pokagan. And many years before that, this was, he had seen people of the Potawatomi Nation emptied out of Michigan in much the same way as the Cherokees were taken out of Georgia and in that area and what was called the Trail of Tears. They often called the Potomotomy Trail of Death and it went through Michigan and Indiana and Illinois and included uh, natives from all those states. It was near anywhere as near as big as the Trail of Tears, but it was um, quite uh, 
how do I say? Oh, it, it, it was every bit as tragic. Um, now, Babyface Nelson, I want to talk about him because Michigan doesn't really have any of the big names. When you talk about criminals, getting back to crimes, you know, like, like Dillinger, like, well, which is John Dillinger right there. But on the left, we have Babyface Nelson. By the way, if you ever call him Babyface, you'd love to regret it. People did not call him that to his face. He, his Michigan connection though, was that his very first robbery in which he led an entire crew to rob a bank happened in Grand Haven. On a, keep mentioning August, this is a good time to be talking because I guess this was an August day uh, in the 1930s and he, and uh, the group went in and robbed the bank and in the melee afterwards, as they were escaping, and be, they, they found out that somebody pointed a gun at their getaway driver, and the getaway driver got away. So they had to find another getaway car. They hijacked a car that was stopped at a light, drove for a few miles, realized it was out of gas. They saw a family at the side of the road in a fruit stand with a really nice car. This Grand Rapids family was standing there getting strawberries and they looked up and here comes this gang, including Babyface Nelson, getting into their car and driving it away. That got them about another five or so miles before they got a flat tire. They finally got one that got them all the way to the state of Indiana, which is where they had to get because back then, Bank robbery was a state crime. Now it's a federal crime because of guys like this. It, it happened not long after that. And so cops can chase them across the state lines. The guy on the right, Don John Dillinger, speaking of Indiana, one of his most famous jail escapes, probably his most famous jail escape. And he had a couple. Uh, he was... Um, was in Indiana, but it involved somebody else. It involved an accomplice for whom his story ended rather dramatically in Michigan. So John Dillinger, remember he whittled a gun out of soap or wood, according to the stories, pointed it at a guard, polished it with shoe polish, pointed it at a guard, the guard came, uh, the guard let him out. Some historians think that's malarkey, that he probably just paid the guy to let him out, but the cops thought it sounded better if they threatened him, than if he threatened him. He asked, anybody here want to help me get out of here? He had one volunteer, and that was Howard Youngblood. Mr. Youngblood was uh, in facing possible, probably the death sentence. He had shot somebody who was running a poker game in the back of his grocery store. He came in to rob the poker game. The owner of the store resisted. And so Mr. Youngblood shot him to death. And so he says, I will help you get out uh, to John Dillinger. He grabbed a toilet plunger to intimidate anybody who came by him. And then they got to a place where they found some of the police guns. They grabbed those and they hit the road. Well, once they parted ways in Chicago, uh, John Dillinger gave him a thanks and gave him a um, uh, and gave and gave him a hundred dollars. So Herbert Youngblood hopped the trains into Detroit and then up to Port Huron. He spent about a week in Port Huron. And he was trying to blend in. So he went to the south side of the city in a very industrial part that was largely African-American. So he thought he would blend in, but he didn't do what he needed to to blend in because he was drunk all the time. And he was kind of bragging about some of his exploits, including that he knew John Dillinger and that he had escaped from jail. Uh, and finally, he went to get some cigarettes at a, this store, a black owned store, and he grabbed them and uh, just started smoking them. And the uh, owner of the store says, "You, who was a teenage kid, said, you better put those back or you better, well, now that you're smoking, you better pay me. 
says, nope, not going to do it. Stood there acting belligerent. The son of the owner called the police. The police arrived and they frisked him. They missed a gun that he had. He started shooting. There was a shootout. All three of the cops were shot, two of them not fatally. And the boy, when a gun was dropped, dove for it and shot Herbert Youngblood several times. So he was the one that was the um, kind of the hero of the day. Now, um, I just wanted to read a little bit from my second book about the end of that story. Um, it says, uh, Youngblood was taken to Port Huron Hospital with six to 10 new holes in his body. Slipping away from life, he asked for a Catholic priest to pray with him and give him last rites. The priest granted him conditional absolution or the forgiveness of his sins on the condition that he cooperate with police. While officers searched Port Huron's underground haunts for public enemy number one, the priest repeatedly told the mortally wounded criminal that he could cross over to the next life with a clean slate if he only would help police catch the bad man. Young blood pre pleaded, uttering over and over, pray for me, Father, as the priest leaned in to catch his dying words. Young blood did end up whispering that Dillinger had crossed the river and was heading further into Canada. That information was probably not absolution worthy since it was false. Yet it was all young blood was giving, not wanting to die a rat. Um, now, another very famous case. If you go on vacation in Charlevoix, you'll see a low road. You'll see a place that looks like a castle that's now in an, an event venue. Used to be, they used to have concerts there. I saw Aerosmith there in the early 90s. They, um, Leopold and Loeb, one of the crimes of the 20th century, 1924. Loeb was the son. He used to spend all of his summers in Charlevoix. The crime actually took place in Chicago. But since this family left a big imprint in Charlevoix, I tell it here as well. They thought, they read Nietzsche, who talked about man and Superman. They thought that they could be supermen. They thought they had the intellect to pull off the perfect crime. They started stealing things. Then they figured they have to escalate that. Let's the perfect murder. They dared each other. No one's going to back down. They finally even thought of a victim, and it was a 15-year-old kid who was somewhat related to Leopold. Now, Lo, by the way, was the youngest person at that to, to University of Michigan, and now he was at University of Chicago. They did kidnap this. They, they were given this kid a ride. They beat him to death in the car. They left him in Indiana in a place where they thought they wouldn't catch him. They finally, Leopold was shooting his mouth off saying, you know, uh, kind of bragging and saying, if I were to kill somebody, it would be that smug little son of a bitch like that kid, you know? So he kind of gave it away, but it was a pair of glasses that Loeb had that were very unique. And they went to eye doctors in the area and finally found out who had these eyeglasses. Loeb died in prison. He was, uh, he was executed in I mean, he was, he was, he was murdered in prison. Um, but the way they got their money and why they left such a big imprint on, on, on Charlevoix is that his dad was one of the big, was the, one of the uh, like top two or three people in Sears Roebuck and Company, which was truly, of course, the Amazon of its day. So um, now, you go to the Western UP, there's a place called, am I running out of time? Oh, I guess I'm doing okay on time, aren't I? Um, there's a place that claims to be, it's called Lake Gilgibic, beautiful, big, cold, deep lake. It's there's a sign there and there's a legend there that this is where the last stagecoach robbery west of the, east of the Mississippi occurred. I don't know how anybody actually knows that, but 
it's far more interesting that it was this man here who was the one who uh, perpetrated it. And his name was Raymond Holsey. And he, well, he shot one of the victims in the stagecoach robbery. And it was a wealth, the three wealthy guys that were on vacation there and the guy bled to death. So on the 30 mile ride to the hospital is when the guy died. It would not have been a fatal wound most likely otherwise, but that made Holsey a murderer. So for about three or so days, he's running through the Western UP in some of the wildest, rockiest, you know, roughest terrain. And he ends up in a place called, uh, in a little mining town. Uh, all of a sudden it escaped me, it'll come back to me. But anyway, um, then he, um, he was caught, he blamed it on dime novels, on, they were the, th you know, uh, uh, um, these dime novels of, of Western lore were really popular at the time. And he even, adopted the nickname of the Midwestern Black Bart after one of the villains in the novels he was reading. Now, he was put in prison and he, he volunteered for, he said it was because he fought, fell off a horse and had a brain injury and that's when he turned to crime. Well, he had volunteered to have something called trepanning, where they take out a piece of your skull, supposedly to relieve the pressure on your brain. So it'll flat back up. Well, he was a model prisoner and the governor of Michigan, Governor Osborne did commute his sentence and let him out of prison early. And he, he, he lived for another 50 or 60 years after that. Um, Michigan and Wisconsin, staying in the UP here for a minute. Uh, well, also the Northern Lower Peninsula was in the 1870s uh, was, there was a craze of news stories and other reporting that was talking about the prostitution industry in Michigan and Wisconsin. There was a woman by the name of Minnie Pine who told them that, uh, to, who, who's, told the story to the press that she had been tricked into going up to a Crystal Falls brothel. And then once she was there, she could not leave. She was coerced into a life of prostitution and such. And there were a lot of stories like this. Now, of course, there were some women who chose the profession, and, uh, but there was also a lot of despair within the profession. And both governors of the governors of Michigan, Governor Luce at the time, and the governor of Wisconsin did studies on it. Michigan's pretty much said that's eh, not a problem. Wisconsin said, yeah, it's uh, all the women there want to be there. Well, then a woman by the name of Dr. Catherine Bushnell, she did her own study. She talked to 200 people uh, or, or more than that. You know, she talked to many, many people and re-interviewed them and did a much more in-depth study. And uh, well, this was the 1800s. Um, read you a little bit just from here, uh, my latest book, Dark Side of the Mitten. See, I did, I had a career in journalism. I could have never written what this guy wrote. And it's, a, it's also, just 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 infuriating because instead of refuting her findings he says uh she is not what one would call an artist's dream unless that artist had lunched on mince pie and pickles before going to sleep on a rail pile that must have been a really sick burn back in the 1800s i don't know but uh you know i would have been fired for <laughs> poo-pooing a study like by talking about a person's looks uh, but to stay on the problem of the brothels, they were everywhere. Clare County was probably the worst. 
This guy that I just drew, pull up his picture. That his name is James Carr, and I don't believe he's related to me. Uh, but he is one. He's a pretty awful guy. He ran one of the 21 brothels in Clare County in the 1870s during the height of the lumber boom. He spent a couple of years in lumbering and said, ah, that's not for me. So he wired back to his friend Maggie Duncan, who was in Rochester, New York, which was where he first came from. And he says, let's start a brothel. So she and he did, and they hired or got, you know, coerced, whatever, uh, some young women into uh, joining up. There were a lot of rumors swirling around. He was actually the number one taxpayer in the entire county at one point because that brothel was so successful. He was paying even more to the county than the lumber companies, but that's also politics. I mean, they were getting out of it, but, and that was also a point of contention between lumber concerns and farming concerns. Well, anyway, uh, James Carr, these rumors were swirling around that he had uh, committed arson. He had burned down a competitor's house. He had uh, had a guy shot uh, because he picked him off. He hired another guy to shoot him in, a saloon, in another saloon far away from his place. There were people who came there and disappeared. And finally, uh, oh, and also he, there was a young woman by the name of Frankie Osborne who came up from Saginaw. And there were also, there were often fake advertisements that brought women from some of the bigger cities to these places, saying clerical worker, caretaker, this or that. Anyway, Frankie came from Saginaw. She was not feeling well one night. She declined to dance with a customer. James Carr saw that and he beat her. Beat her up her gun a couple of days later and she died. They still could not get anything on him until another guy who shared a jail cell with James Carr, who was in on a minor thing for a couple of days, agreed to do some work for him. He agreed to burn a body and agreed to, uh, to shoot a deputy in the back. And he agreed to do this for $500, which was a lot of money at the day, but he did burn the body then he got cold feet and he felt bad about that. He confessed it to a traveler. The traveler went to a deputy the next day, told him what he told him. They finally had enough to lock away James Carr and Maggie Duncan. But they didn't get, weren't there for very long. They came back, they were hooked on drugs so badly they thought they'd come back there and restart their brothel but by then the lumber concerns had moved and it was not, nothing but farmers so they would not have had much of a clientele they died penniless in an unheated shack in the middle of march in northern russia and finally i've got one more from the latest book dark side of the Men. And this is a guy, we've all heard about the King of Beaver Island. And I have stuff about him in my other two books, but this is somebody who was kind of a similar thing. He just kind of declared himself the boss of everything. It was not an island, but it was in the town of Rogers City on the Huron Shore, North, Northern Huron Shore of Michigan. His name was Albert Molitor. He came in from Germany. This is a German uniform that he's got on there. He came over and he acted like a baron. He basically, he was co-owner of Rogers Molitor Lumber Company, which was the biggest thing going on there at the time in the 1870s and then, uh, eight, yeah, 1880s. Anyway, so he, um, he, uh, he ran rough shot over everybody. He, he was stealing money from the till. He was giving people, Paying people in scrip, which you know they could only they could only uh, uh, redeem at the company store, and so he had prices were that were really high. Anyway, he he had enemies everywhere. He levied um, taxes for new roads, something like thirty thousand dollars. Money disappeared, and he never they never got their new roads. So they came to try to string him up one day just to intimidate him. There was a day long standoff. 
finally he ordered food to be a table to be set out there. He sat down and ate after an entire day of waiting, these guys just grumbled and left. But Molitor also, it wasn't just with business. He also was, uh, well, he was an early Me Too um, kind of candidate because he was uh, basically um, offending every, oops, nope, that's not what I wanted. Offending everybody uh, like, you know, um, through the women in town, he would be putting the moves on their daughters, their wives, their mothers. He had saw a picture of a guy, uh, of, a, of a young woman that one of his employees had. He says, oh, you know, bring her over from Germany and she can work for me. Brings her over from Germany. He makes her his personal servant. She becomes pregnant with his child. He promises to marry her. Says, we'll do this down in Detroit. Gets her on a sleigh. They go 250 miles on a sleigh down to Detroit. And um, they, uh, and he came up to a street corner and kicked her off the sleigh. She sued. They awarded her $10,000, but he wasn't ever going to pay anybody. Anyway, finally, everybody was so ticked off at him in the town that a whole bunch of guys came out of this window at dusk one night in, come to think of it, it was August. Um, anyway, he, um, they, uh, they shot him through the window. He lingered for a few days, he died. Uh, and um, nobody, it was like murder on the Oregon Express. Nobody was going to come forward and point the finger at anybody or confess or anything. It took them 11 years to find one person who was kind of a scapegoat. But it sounds like it was something that, you know, there were many people in on the, on the plan, many shots fired from different angles. So basically, he, they gave him some pioneer comeuppance, I guess. Uh, and uh, so that is a story that I found out just before I started my third book. And uh, it is one of the many in Dark Side of the Mitten. And I really appreciate it, you all of you talking. And I'm going to answer questions if you have any. I wanna leave it on this page. You can order books. As I was telling Katie, I'm working on a easier. But if you send me an email at the top email address, just say what you want and I'll tell you how we do it. And if you want to pay by card, I can call you or something like that. So we don't have to be sending your numbers over the thing, or we can figure out whatever is comfortable for you. Or you can order it also with a private message at Facebook, whoops, at facebook.com slash Tom Carr author. Tom Carr author is my Facebook author page name. $16.95 each for all, but for all three, uh, there's a bundle price for $45. So I thank you all very much. And uh, what questions might you have? Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, how do you feel about a lot of these incidences or, or um, events in history? Or how do you find them? Well, um, that's a good question because my very first book, I was digging up stuff and Google and Michigan murder and looking at other people's lists of the biggest uh, murders in Michigan and this and that. And it was just, you know, there were all kinds of uh, different ways to go about it. Once I started talking to people and doing author events, people would tell me about things that they had heard. And so in my subsequent books, I have stories that many of them, I still look up and I, you know, or I hear, I read, I just happen upon but many of them have been told to me by people who uh, come up to me um, at these events and tell me about them. So, uh, but there's a lot of different ways. I mean, you can do Google searches and you can, you know, just, uh, I, I look through a lot of old newspapers and stuff like that. So. Uh, Cheryl has a question. What got you interested in these types of crimes? What got me interested? Yes. Uh, well, I've read some fascinating um, uh, true crime books in my, uh, you know, and uh, 
I also, as a reporter, covered some true crime, and in my, I may have covered some crime, and um, in my, most of it was fairly, and I hate to say run of the mill, because there's no run of the mill crime if you or somebody you know is a victim, but um, there was a standout uh, murder case that I covered mm -hmm. in 1996, and it's in, it's in my first book, Blood on the Mitten, and it's in a and it's in a chapter titled A Convenient Confession. And it was about a woman who was murdered at her home in a rather um, really dis disturbing way, but I won't go into that right now. But um, they, um, there was DNA evidence that, that there was a confession of a young man who was in trouble for other things as well but he confessed it and then later recanted his confession, but they didn't let him recant it, even though the DNA come back as not, came back as not his. So the prosecutor had to get somebody on this. So he was, um, well, anyway, I'm going into a lot of detail about that one case, but anyway, so I, I covered it for many years because um, they, it wasn't until the Innocence Project got involved with it back uh, about 17 years after the, the the event, like in 2013, and they the, they had a judge um, mandate that the DNA be sent in the into the database, and they found the actual killer in no time at all. And so the guy who spent like 17 years in prison for it was not. Was, was was freed. So anyway, that is in this book. To make a long story short, um, just, you know, there are the, the, that and other cases that I've covered or read about have given me the interest in it. Uh, we have a question from Holly. How long does it typically take you to write a book? Which one took you the longest? Um, well, these took me the longest that's a good question these take me well my first one took me like a winter and i was my i worked on it for an entire winter they take everything from a couple from several months i would say oh gosh everything from like seven or eight months to a year or two depending on the book but I'm some people are much faster at it than I am. <laughs> so uh, I have a question. Which uh, crime story is your favorite? Which crime story? Well, I will tell you, there's one that I didn't include tonight, but it's one that I might be doing a book about. And that is in my first book. And that is called, well, oh, <laughs> my. It's about a man who killed his own daughter and her friends. Hippie haters gonna hate. It's in my first book. Anyway, because she was living like a hippie, he killed her and her friends. The thing that makes it really interesting is that a lot of people, there was a movie that came out with Peter Boyle that came out that very year that some people thought was based on it. It wasn't, but it was kind of parallel and it's just kind of a real sign of the times. And people, a lot of people, and the guy who killed his daughter actually got a ton of fan mail while he was under, while he was at trial and such. Um, the other one I told you about James Carr, that's not a single crime, but I find that whole thing so fascinating, this whole story, that that's another one I may be breaking out into a book. Other than that, I guess I would say the ones that I have for, for years and years have fascinated me are the one, uh, the Bath School Massacre, and also this, I didn't talk about tonight, but it was uh, the Italian Hall disaster in the UP in Calumet in 1913 when somebody yelled fire and that crowded Christmas party and everybody ran down the stairs and 73 people died. 
not a murder per se, can't prove, you know, but just an amazing uh, story and just unbelievably tragic. So anyway, again, it's hard to, it's hard to narrow it down to one. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, I always have lots of questions. Are there any questions? Uh, any questions well, from yeah, anybody you can else? <laughs> ask away. Yeah, I'm glad to answer. Um, and also, okay. oh, 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 go sorry. ahead. I was just going to say also, if you do go to my Facebook uh, author page, I hope to within the next few days get my. Squarespace page up and I will announce it there. I plan to, if all goes well. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to order a book, please do by um, G, the, the Gmail address is probably the, excuse me, the best way. Until then. Um, I'm kind of curious about your research. Do you go to public libraries or, and do you have a fact checker? Well, I have editors who do also fact check the facts, and also the um, I do go to libraries. I um, uh, my favorite for this kind of research is the Library of Michigan in Lansing, and they now are just. I just got an email that they are open by appointment, so I hope to be taking advantage of that soon. Um, they have just the documents, the periodicals, the, the books uh, as well, but also just the, the state records and the, and the newspapers are just fantastic. I have a subscription to newspapers.com and I get a lot from there as well, but there's a lot of Michigan ones they don't have. If I go, they, they have just about everything, not everything, but you know, pretty close to it at the Library of Michigan. So yeah, and then there's also every on some of the more, more recent ones, perhaps police records, court records, things like that. Uh, I guess my last question would be, how did you decide what your titles for your books were going to be? Well, the most inspired one was the very first one, Blood on the Mitten. And that's why I've said, and that's the one most people have responded to. I just thought of it somehow, you know, I just thought of it and thought, did anybody, has anybody ever used that for a mystery, like said in Michigan? And I thought, because if they haven't, they should. <laughs> but now they better not. But anyway, so I just figured, you know, it's great. It's symbolic. The second one was, I don't, and, and I can't pinpoint it at all, but it's like, you know, I, I sit there and I, and I write things down on a pad and I've gone on, on blood on the mitten was the first one that came to me and it stuck. It was so good. It's the best book title I'll ever, I'll probably ever dream up. Uh, my bad was a, voila motion moment at one point probably while i was mowing the lawn or something that's when i get a lot of, you know when your mind is free to wander and dark side of the mitten i just thought i wanted to tie it in with you know what else can you do to mitten so um yeah the most by far the most uh um inspired title i've ever written was blood on the mitten Any other questions? No more questions? Oh, we had a comment. Fascinating stories. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And who was, thank you, whoever that was. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and please, uh, yeah. Do contact me for books. I'm happy to, I will send them out to you. And um, I do have to charge uh, uh, usually about $5 for shipping. I didn't mention that up front. Is if, if that's a problem with you, just remind me that I didn't mention it right away and then let it go. But 
Um, because I we do have another question. What's oh, that? we have two. Okay, so what's the part of the writing process that takes the longest? Wow, part of the writing process that takes the longest. That's interesting. Probably, um, well, probably the 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 rewrite the, the many re rewrites uh, because quite often I'm I'm I think I'm inspired. I have the information and I start to write it down and I think, oh, this is great. You know, it's great stuff, blah, 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 blah. I go back to read it and I thought, yeah, that's how I said that. So, you know, you kind of, and, and so it's so it's very much uh, um, the rewriting process. I guess I don't know this for a fact, but it's like, you know, because I don't paint, but I mean, a painter being, you know, dabbling and always touching something up, you know, a little bit, all oh, those, those pine trees could be a little bit, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, just uh, no one went, and and I guess it's a, it's also you have to know when to quit, uh, which deadlines pretty much let you know what the, when the, when to quit. But you know, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's the rewrite. It's the constant rewrite. And if you do have problem right at first, don't necessarily worry about it because when I'm not inspired, I'll just start writing down facts, just telling. Like, okay, Katie, I'm gonna tell you as though I'm sitting here right here and talking to you. So, um, and I kind of remind myself of that. And, uh, oh, and one person one time that came to a show said she came to get the book because a friend had read, been reading it uh, over a campfire. And she thought it was, you know, she liked it. And so she, she came and got it. And I thought, well, sometimes I think, okay, how would I tell this around a campfire? Like, I don't want this to sound like a newspaper as much as I love newspapers. I want it to sound like a friend telling a friend or, you know, like just a storyteller. It has its own voice. Yes, yes, very good. Very good point, yeah. Um, Cheryl wants to know if they, if you would sign a copy for them if they order it. Absolutely. And let me know in the email or the message that, um, like, if you want me to sign it to you, I'll sign it to your name. Or if you want to give it as a gift, I'll sign it to their name. Or if you just want, some people say just your signature. And, and yeah, so whichever way you want it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, however you would like it. And she just thumbs. That was Cheryl, right? Yeah. <laughs> Gave me a thumbs up, so I said that was good. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. <laughs> uh -huh. First, I've heard anybody else. Oh, I see the. Oh, that's because I see the little cross off the things. Anyway, yeah, I'm getting to learn this Zoom thing here. So, no worries. It takes a little bit to get used to. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I just changed. I just went from Mac back to PC um, because I had a Mac for a while and I really missed. PCs for a few, I won't go into all that, but so I'm kind of, everything's like, you know, does it work now? Does it, you know, I'm kind of getting back into the groove there. Oh, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there are, are there any more questions? I could stay all night and talk. If, I mean, I could always ask away. I always have a hundred questions, but I'm, I'm sure not everyone wants to stay up all night listening to me <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> well, they were very good questions and I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you coming and uh, spending some time listening to my stories. And hopefully I can come and maybe uh, talk to you face to face at some point. So. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you so much, and I enjoyed it. Thank you, Katie, and the Lion Township Library, and everybody who came. Thank you, Tom. Please. All right.